Well, good morning, everyone. We are starting a new series, and I'm so excited on the book of Daniel. It's entitled Integrity, Trusting God in a Hostile World. Uh, what do you do when you live in a society where more and more Christians are the bad guys? What do you do when uh, everywhere you go, the moment they find out you're a Christian, they begin to make fun of you, they mock you, they shame you into silence, uh, they don't want to have anything to do with you because uh, they have these preconceived ideas of what a Christian is. And so how do, you, how do you respond to that? How do you engage this culture in a meaningful way, in a way that, that glorifies God? So we, we will study uh, the book of Daniel that gives us some really good answers to those questions. Uh, we have booklets available. Raise your hand if you don't have one and you'd like one. We do these so that you could be part of a small group, a care group, where you could study God's truth and be uh, encouraged and encourage others to follow the principles that you learn on Sunday. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 1, where we will look at the beginning of this exciting book, and I pray that you will not only learn, but it will transform your life. But let's pray before we start. Father God, we are so grateful to you for your love. We are grateful to you, Lord, that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the sacrifice for our sins so that we could have a relationship with you. We thank you that your love is not something that can be earned, and it's not something that could be lost, that it is not only unconditional, but it is eternal. And so, Father, we, we are grateful for the reminder from the song that was sung. And I pray now, Father, that you would open our hearts and our minds as we study the truths found in this book, that you would speak through me, that your name would be lifted up and glorified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How do you cope when life takes a wrong turn? Uh, let's see the first installment of our media short film. I think we're lost. I know where we are. No, I mean us. Our marriage. I think we made a wrong turn somewhere. I don't think counseling is working. And I'm so tired of smiling in front of our parents. It just feels wrong, fake. The only place I feel real is my small group. They don't judge, they just listen. Let me be where I am. And I hate where I am. where we are. It's just a hard time. The Lord will get us through this. Then the next day and the next, we just gotta get through it. Like always, your solution is always just to get through the day. Well, some people don't have another day to get through. I don't know how to make this right. None of this is my fault. But you make me feel like it is. I think you want to you want to blame me so you can feel better for yourself. Do you really believe that? Yes. <laughs> so this is on me now. No. I'm trying, but you don't want to try. That is just exactly it. I don't want to try. I'm tired of trying. God knows how tired I am. We're both tired. I'm tired. But God's our rest, right? He'll give us rest. We just got to just got to pull through this. Like I know, 
I know you believe that. And I love that you believe that. I love your sustained hope in Christ. I just... I don't know if I believe it anymore. visit her. I can't visit our daughter when we're like this. I don't I don't think I could do this with you anymore. I need you. Wow, Academy Award stuff. That's really good. <laughs> Looking forward to more. <laughs> so how do you cope when life takes a wrong turn? Um, in, our, in our text, Judah, the southern kingdom, has just been invaded by King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Judah's army has been defeated, people captured, the temple treasures taken. And Daniel and his friends were deported to a strange country with pagan customs. I mean, talk about losing a child. Daniel and his friends ended up working for King Nebuchadnezzar, whose armies were known for their cruelty, whose armies would dash babies against rocks. That's the type of, that's the type of environment and culture that Daniel and them were exposed to. And in our passage, you find that the nation Israel took a major wrong turn. In this passage, you see where, or in this map, you see where Jerusalem is and you see where Babylon is. This is the, Arab, uh, this is the Arabian desert and you don't just go through it. This is Saudi Arabia today. And so what you would do, you would go up north to Aleppo and then you would follow the Euphrates River, and it's a journey of about 500 miles. Now, what do you do when you take a wrong turn? If you've ever made a wrong turn into a bad neighborhood, you, you quickly want to get out. But what do you do when you take a wrong turn and you stay there for 70 years? What do you do when there's no turning back? Um, it says in our text, in the third year of the king of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Many things we'll talk about in this verse, but... I just want you to, to point out the fact that he calls it the land of Shinar, which is an ancient term to talk about Babylon. Why did Daniel use that term? Let me submit to you that it's because he was hearkening back to 
Genesis chapter 11, where the Tower of Babel were, was built in the land of Shinar. And here, Daniel was giving you a foreshadowing of what's going to occur in this book. That the land of Shinar, the land of Babylon, is where people rebelled against God, where there was wicked, rampant wickedness, and where you could be sure that anyone living a righteous life would be persecuted. Anyone living a righteous life would be challenged. And so he says, he brought them to the land of Shinar. So how do you react when you're in this type of environment? How do you react when you are criticized for standing up for your Christian conviction? Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 16, 15 and 16, says that there are three options and two of them we shouldn't take. One of it is to be isolated from the world. He says, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And so one, one way that people have dealt with a hostile environment or a, a, a pagan society is what? To totally isolate themselves from it. Monks do that. Hermits do that. Um, Jim Jones did it, took his church, took him to Guyana. And so what Jesus is saying, don't remove yourself from the culture. And many times that's what we do as Christians. We just hang out with other Christians. You know, we, we look for a Christian doctor, a Christian dentist, a Christian computer, everything Christian. Right? And we just isolate ourselves. The other, the other strategy which Jesus says we are not to do is don't totally immerse yourself in the culture so much so that people can't tell the difference. That you're just like non-Christians. Because if we're just like non-Christians, then what does the church have to offer the world? Nothing. That's why Jesus says in verse 16, they are not of the world. So don't take them out of the world. They are to be in the world, but they are not to be of the world. And then Jesus says, just as I am not of the world. But when you look at the life of Jesus, he didn't isolate himself from sinners. He engaged sinners. He engaged the culture. And so the big question that we'll have for the book of Daniel is this. How do you engage this culture without compromising your convictions? How can you be in the world but not of the world. Daniel and his friends gives us a marvelous example of how to do it. What do you do when there's chaos all around you? What do you do when you face crisis in your life? Three principles that, to keep in mind when catastrophic events come crashing down on us. Three things that we are to do when the environment that we live in is hostile to us. First of all, stay calm. Stay calm. Don't panic. God controls national events. God is sovereign over the kings and kingdoms of this world. He rules the heart of every dictator, every prime minister, every president, every king. It is God who raises them up and pulls them down. Verse 1 again. It says, in the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of King Josiah, the oldest son, king of Judah, he's the 17th king of the southern kingdom. Uh, the northern kingdom has already been destroyed by the Assyrians in 722. This is at 605 BC. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Uh, king Nebuchadnezzar had just finished an attack, a military um, excursion into Egypt. He defeated Egypt on his way back up. He besieged Jerusalem. A part of it is because they had an alliance with Egypt. So he besieged Jerusalem. In verse 2 it says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. He brought them to the land of Shinar to the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Now, as you read that, you're going, well, what's that all about? Well, he, he took stuff from the temple of Israel 
and put it into the pagan temples of his land to show off. It was like a trophy. The best example I could think of is when we win a, when we win a NBA championship or a um, baseball championship or you win the, the Super Bowl, get the Vince Lombardi trophy. What, what did they do? Once they win, they lift it up. They show it off. And then what did they do? They placed it on a case for everyone to see, meaning what? We won and you guys lost. And that's exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar was doing. He put it on display in his temple so everyone who walks by, everyone who worship will see that the Babylonian god was, gods were more powerful than the God of Israel. That's what he was intending to do. But is that what really happened? Look at the verse again. It says in verse 1 and 2 that it was the, what? The Lord. It was the Lord who gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So what does that tell you? It wasn't the military genius of King Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't the size of his army that overwhelmed Israel. Because if you see... As you see in the past, God could destroy all these armies with just one angel, and he did it in the past. So we find that it was, even though it seemed like a dark time for Israel, even though it seemed like the good guys had lost, that it was the Lord who handed Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, why did he do that? He did that because he was being faithful to his word. In Deuteronomy 28, if you ever have a chance to read it, God makes a covenant with his people. And he says, if you do these things, I will bless you. But if you turn away from me and you worship other gods, he says, I will curse you. And these are the curses, and it's terrible curses. But at the height of those curses, the worst thing could, that could happen is if you, if you continue to live a sinful life, if you continue to turn your back on me and you do not repent, he says, this is what will happen. In Deuteronomy 28, 49, it says, the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand. A lot of times when we talk about God's faithfulness, we only think of blessings. But really when we talk about God's faithfulness, it is merely saying that God, what God says he will do, that he remains true to his word. He remains true to his promises. And so even in this particular case, God was disciplining Israel so that he could draw her back to him, to himself. Even in this, he was showing his, his faithfulness to this nation, to this wayward nation. That if you look at the history of Israel, after the Babylonian captivity, the thing that kept tripping them up, which was what? Idolatry, was never to be found again in Israel. It was because of this act of discipline that God molded, that God shaped, that God purified this nation. And so even in discipline, God was faithful. It was God who handed Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Whenever we, you look at the, the political landscape of the United States, don't make the mistake of pinning your hope on either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Jesus does not sit on the back of an elephant. He does not sit on the back of a donkey. He sits on the throne of heaven. Amen? Amen? Because what happens is when your hope is on a political, one political party, what happens when they get kicked out the next election term? All of a sudden you're, you're sad. All of a sudden you, you don't know what to do. All of a sudden you lose your peace. And what Daniel teaches us is this, that no matter which king, which ruler, earthly ruler, it seemed to be the, the big guy, the, the one in charge. Guess what? It is God who controls him. It is God who raised him up, him up, and it is God who will pull him down. 
Don't ever lose your peace, regardless of who's the president of the United States. Don't ever, ever lose your peace, regardless of who's president of the Philippines. Our hope, our confidence, our trust is in God. So here you find that when, when life takes a wrong turn, stay calm, don't panic. Verse 3, it says, The king commanded Aspenas, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the, of the nobility. So one of the things that he did to make sure that this, the nations that he uh, conquers are weakened is he, he'll take their leaders. So without leaders, the, the nation is, is very weak. He'll take the, their leaders, and he won't just kill them. He'll bring them to his kingdom, and he will retrain them because these guys are very talented. These guys are very intelligent. These guys have skills. So that he would retrain them so he could use them for his kingdom. Now notice that's, that's what happened here. He says, both of the royal family and of the nobility, and in verse 4, youths without blemish, of good appearance, they were good looking, handsome men, and skillful in wisdom and endowed with knowledge. They were intelligent. They were quick learners. It says, understanding and learning and competent to stand in the king's palace. Now, they're competent. They, 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 would, they would be confident. They would, they would have poise. They would know how to speak to kings. They would know the protocols. He says, these are the, the men that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to train who would serve for him and serve with him. It says, and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So they were to be totally immersed in Babylonian culture. It says in verse 5, the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years. So this was a three-year program. It says, and at the end of the time, they were to stand before the king. After three years, after learning the literature and architecture and agriculture and astronomy and astrology and all the, all the things that the Babylonian, the best the Babylonian um, kingdom could offer, they were to stand before the king and they were to have an oral exam. Oops, Ooh, it went fast, sorry. They were to have an oral exam. They were to stand before the king and you were to be tested on all the things that you've learned the past three years. That's in verse 6. And these were Daniel, among these, notice among these, in other words, there was a lot of them, not only from Judah, but even from all the other countries that King Nebuchadnezzar had taken noble nobility from, royal families from. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. Thus, and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. So, to complete the assimilation process, the acculturation process, what they did was they got rid of their name so that they would forget all about the Hebrew culture. You are no longer Jewish. You are now Babylonian. And they took away their Jewish names and they gave them Babylonian names. It says, Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. And one of the things that you'll see about these names is all the Jewish names had to do with with God, with the true God. All the pagan names had to do with the pagan gods that the Babylonians worship. Let me just show you what the names mean. Daniel means God is my judge. And he changed, they changed it to Belteshazzar means Bel protect his life. So Bel, another name for Bel is Marduk, is the god that Nebuchadnezzar worshiped. Hananiah, which means Yahweh is gracious, was changed to Shadrach, which means command of Aku, who was the moon god. Mishael, which means who is what God is. In other words, there's no one like God. Who is what God is? There's no one like God. Was turned to Meshach, or who is what Aku is. So it's just a complete like, uh, mirror of that name, but using Aku, who is the moon god. Azariah, Yahweh is my help, to Abednego, servant of Nebo. And so they, they changed these names to, to totally 
just root out all the, any vestiges of Hebrew culture in these youths, or at least that's what they tried to do. Verse 5, it says, The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate. Daniel and his friends, they agreed with everything except in this one area. They acculturated themselves, but when it came to this area, they drew the line. Thus, of the, of the wine that he drank, they were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that, they were to stand before the king. Um, one of the things that, that you need to do is you need to know where to draw the line. We are to be in the world, but what? Not of the world. And so even though they accepted all these acculturation schemes and, and education and new name, when it came to eating the daily portions of food that the king ate, they refused. Brings us to our second point. When life takes a wrong turn, first of all, stay calm. Secondly, stay clean. Stay clean. Do not compromise your convictions. God is in control not only of national events in your life. God is in control of the personal events in your life. It says in verse 8, But Daniel resolved. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's food. Of the wine and of the wine that which he drank, therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. I like how it's put in the King James, but Daniel purposed in his heart. He made a resolution. He made up his mind ahead of time. I will not defile myself. And he, he asked the chief eunuch, he said, I can't eat what the king serves. And then, of course, he was surprised. Why? You know, it's good stuff. It's the best in the land. In fact, the word food there could be translated rich food. It is the best. Part of the perks of being uh, an intern for the king is to eat his food. Do you know what the king eats? It's the best. But he says, I will not defile myself. And the word defile has a religious connotation. So he explained to him, you know, this, this is against my religion. I cannot eat anything that's not kosher. I cannot eat anything that is dedicated to idols. I love what... Trumper Longman says, Daniel endured much cultural assimilation, yet he knew where it was appropriate for him to draw the line of distinction. There, there, there will come a point in your Christian life where you need to draw the line. Where you need to draw the line. You, you can be in the world, but you must not be of the world. Um, in verse 9, it says, And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. In other words, God's hand was upon Daniel as he, as he made this stance. And I'm sure that he and his friends prayed about it. I'm sure they, they talked about it. And they asked for God. God began to move in a mysterious way. God began to, to, to bless the, the things that Daniel was requesting. It says in verse 10, And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king. So, even though he liked Daniel, he said, Daniel, Daniel, I, I feel you, but dude, you're going to cost me my head. And he says, who assigned your food and your, and your drink, why should, you, why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your age? So if you stand before the king and you look all scrawny and, and haggard and all the other people look, healthy, the king's going to ask me, what, what's up with these guys? Are they sick? And if I tell them no, because I fed them a different diet, what's going to happen to me? It's going to be my head. And so he, he tried to explain this to Daniel. And notice what Daniel did. I love what Daniel did. He was persistent, but not belligerent. In other words, he didn't turn it into, uh, I'm going to go on a hunger strike. He wasn't uh, arguing with them. What did he do? Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, he was persistent, and he asked a subordinate, 
Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. So he made a reasonable request. He says, why don't you put us to the test? These guys, the rest of the guys, they could eat what the king serves. Me and my friends, we'll, we'll just eat vegetables and we'll just drink water. And he says, test us for 10 days and see what happens. And, and I'm sure he, he and his friends were praying, Lord, please. Put your hand sovereignly upon the situation. Lord, we don't want to defile ourselves. Lord, we want to commit ourselves to, to living our lives for you. And so, God, if, if you don't answer, if, if we lose, you lose. So, God, please work, work in, this, in this situation. Notice what happened. Or notice the, the rest of the, the challenge. He says, then let your, our, our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. In other words, at the end of 10 days, make a judgment. And deal with your servants according to what you see. Deal with your servants according to what you see. So they had 10 days. And for 10 days, all they ate was vegetable and water. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. Even that, even the, him agreeing to it, the steward agreeing to it, that was from God. And he agreed. I like what Lutzer says. He says, of course, we have to take a stand against the culture, but we must do it in a way that never loses sight of Jesus. We stand against the culture with a redemptive mindset. In other words, whenever you deal with people who don't agree with you, the goal is not simply to win the argument. The goal is to win the person to Christ. It is always... With, a, with an eye towards Jesus, that I'm making this stance because of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and our, our, our stand is to, be, is to be humble. It's not to be, it's not to be proud. It's not to make the other person look foolish with our arguments. It is to win the other person to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here you find that they, they, they ask, but they ask in a respectful, reasonable manner. I also like what he says later on. He says, it has been said, once we open the door to sin, it takes us further than we intend to go, keeps us longer than we intend to stay, and costs us more than we intend to pay. I like that statement. That when th there is no such thing as a small act of compromise or a small act of disobedience. Because sin will always take you there longer than you want to be there. And you'll always pay more than you, you thought you were going to pay. And so he says, no, no such thing as a small act of disobedience. And the best time, really, to, to make a stand against sin is way before it happens. He says, he resolved in his heart before the food was set before him. Don't wait till temptation is right in front of you before you decide whether to obey God or not. Daniel didn't wait till the rib eye was there, and the Merlot was there, and the foie gras was, was on the side. He didn't wait. That would have been too late. Probably would have been too late for me if I was like, oh, my goodness. So what did he do? He resolved beforehand. He purposed in his heart. Young people, purpose in your heart not to defile yourself before you, go, before you even go to college before you even go in that dorm that's co-ed, where people have such different moral standards from you. You need to resolve purpose in your heart that you will not defile yourself be before you, you get into a dating situation, before you get into a relationship. Purpose in your heart. Be resolved. I will not defile myself. Purpose in your heart, businessman. Before you go on that trip, even before you purchase the ticket, and you go to that town where no one knows you, and you're in a hotel where you could choose any entertainment you, you, you want to choose, purpose in your heart that you will not defile yourself. Before you turn on that computer, before you, you flick, you, you, you start surfing Netflix or Amazon Prime or any of these, or, or HBO, or stars, or any of these entertainment 
uh, venues that are open to us. Purpose in your heart. Resolve in your mind that you will not defile yourself. God is looking for people to bless. And many times we, God tests us and we block God's blessing because we think, ah, oh, it's just a small act of disobedience. Who will know? Who will see? No one will ever know. And so we, we, we miss out on God's blessing for our lives because we think it's just a small act of compromise. You know, a good verse in Job 31.1, it says, I made a covenant with my eyes. It's the same thing as I resolve or I purpose in my heart that I will not look lustfully at a girl. Man, that's a good verse. That's a good verse uh, to, to tape on your, on your screen uh, before you turn on that computer. And so we need to understand that when life takes a wrong turn, first of all, we need to stay calm. God is in control of national events. Secondly, we need to remain clean. God is in control of our, of our personal uh, circumstances. He's in control of our boss. He's in control of our supervisors. Don't ever compromise your conviction to get ahead. Don't ever think, well, if I don't do this, this transaction, which is actually under the table or uh, under the books, out of, uh, out of the books, that uh, I, won't, I will get fired, that I will, I will not get promoted. Don't compromise your convictions. Remain clean. Third, stay confident. Why? Because God is in control of the results. God is in control of the results. Verse 15, it says, at the end of 10 days, notice how, what happened at the end of the 10-day experiment. So at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. How could that be? You eat vegetable and water, and they eat all the king's rich food, and yet you're fatter? You're healthier? Um, I don't know if they had vitamin supplements, but I know they had God with them. It was God who was orchestrating the event. Verse 16, so the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And so for three years while they were training, that was their diet. Verse 17, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And notice how uh, God began to bless them. See, there's no such thing as a small act of disobedience. There's no such thing as a small act of obedience. You might say, well, that's, that's kind of, you know, it's just a dietary law. Yeah, but God was watching. And it was because they obeyed that God propelled them into, into political heights that they would never have dreamed of. Verse 18, at the end of that time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. You know, they, they commended themselves, I mean, uh, ex in a, an excellent manner. They were, they were head and shoulders above anyone else that the king tested. It says in verse 20, And in every matter of wisdom, I like this. And understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all of his kingdom. So the king was amazed. These four guys were far superior than any other young people, any other uh, worker that he has ever interviewed. Why is that? Because they're just smart? Because they were just highly gifted and worked hard? No, it was because God's hand was upon them. There are times when God will test you. And he will test you because he wants to know, can I trust you with my blessings? Can I trust you with my blessings? And during those times when you're tempted to cross the line, Understand that you have a God who's in control of the situation. And you do not have to worry because he is in charge 
of the result. He controls your time and your, and, and the, your destiny and the things in your life that you worry about so often that, that causes you to cross the line. God is the one he's in, who's in control, and he's working things out for your good. Even if you lose that job, guess what? God has a better job. I mean, I, I see it that many times, even in my family's life, I see his hand of blessing. That there are times when they would apply, and it seems like, you know, there's, there's so many other people who are applying for it, but when, it, when God wants to bless you, he will give you that job. I, I'll give you an example. When my, my uh, middle daughter was applying for a job at a restaurant, and she just turned in the application, she was just standing there. She thought she was supposed to wait for the owner. And the owner was kept going back and forth, and then finally the owner came, oh, you're still here. And so she got her application. And so she called her and said, oh, I want to hire you. And then when my daughter just thought nothing of it, then she showed her a stack of application about an inch thick. She says, you see all these applications? You're in high school. These guys are college students. They all have, they all have experience in, in the restaurant business. So, but I, something told me to, to hire you. Someone told me. It's just something in my heart that said, I, I need to hire you. You know who that something was? That was God. <laughs> and so there are times when, when you would try to manipulate things, and, and really you just need to relax. You just need to understand that it is God who determines your destiny. Not only that, you find that Daniel lived a long life. Not only did God bless at that point when he was probably about, oh, at this point, maybe 19 years old, 18 years old, or even younger, to the time in, to the time in chapter 10 where he says he was serving King Cyrus. At that point, he was probably 83 to 85, depending on when he started. So God gave him a long career. But all of that was possible. Why? Because he was obedient and he trusted God. In spite of the fact that the nation had been destroyed, the nation had been brought over, in spite of the fact that this was a hostile environment, he trusted God and he remained faithful to God. What do you do when life takes a wrong turn? Stay calm. God's in control of national events. Stay clean. God is in control of personal events. Stay confident. God is in control of the results. When life takes a wrong turn, I will continue to trust and obey a God who is in control. When life takes a wrong turn, I will continue to trust and obey a God who is in control. Let me show you the end of the short film. How'd you like the message? It's good. Really good, actually. Yeah? Yeah. It was nice just to remember that people suffer and can still trust God. I don't know. It wasn't anything new. I just I needed to hear it. How did you know it was going to be a good message? <laughs> it's by faith. <laughs> Let me end with this before we, take up our, we partake of communion. There, there, there's a word that's repeated three times. And each of it is really the, the major points that we gave, that, that I shared. And it's the word gave. In verse 2, it says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands. In verse 9, and God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of eunuchs. In verse 17, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. Throughout this dark time, you see the hand of God that gave. The darkest time in the history of mankind it's when Adam and Eve sin. That's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The worst turn that you could make in your life 
is to die without the Lord Jesus Christ. God controls what he gives, but he cannot control what you believe and what you receive. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Would you like to? Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if today you've come, or if you're watching through our live feed, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come to him right now. In the quietness of this moment, God loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for your sins so that you could be forgiven. And the promise in the Bible is this, whosoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so in this, this morning, if you'd like to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come to him right now. In the quietness of this moment, just pray this prayer with me quietly in your heart. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I here and now put my faith in you alone as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, I thank you for anyone who's prayed that prayer. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their newfound faith. If you're a believer and God has spoken to you, maybe there are areas in your life that you are compromising in. Uh, I want you to know that, that God forgives. That God gives second chances. That God loves you. And this is perhaps his most gentle way of just speaking to you. But don't wait for him to discipline you. Allow him to do a work of grace in your life right now. So if there are areas in your life that you need to ask forgiveness of, would you just do business with him in the quietness of this moment? And affirm once again, that he not only is a loving God and a wise God, but he is a powerful God, that he is in control of your situation. And if you're worried, just renew your, your, your faith in him and say, Lord, I thank you that you could control nations, you could control bosses, you could control the outcome of my test. Lord, thank you that you're sovereign over my situation. And just find peace in that truth. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, for, for your love for us, for your infinite patience with each one of us. I thank you, Lord, that you, you remain faithful through the times that we are faithless. For you cannot deny yourself. And I pray, Father, that as we study the life of Daniel, that you would continue to cause changes in our hearts and in our lives. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.